he made a spur of the moment decision to jump on a bus to New York. Now, I don't know where the bus is coming from. I'm guessing it's from the DC area, um, but I don't know where he was living at the time. So this could have been like from California to New York, like, you know, in one of the movies. I say hopped on a spur of the spur of the moment, hopped on a bus to go to the US premiere of the final Harry Potter movie and camped out overnight in line. Um, that's commitment, but he was rewarded for that commitment because he met both uh, Rupert Grint and Daniel Radcliffe. So let's applaud him for his um, dogmatic desire to see Harry Potter and welcome Tyler to the stage. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks uh, for the introduction, Jared. Uh, my name is Tyler Morganwall, and I'm a researcher at the Institute for Defense Analysis here in Washington, D.C. I took the bus from Baltimore, so it wasn't California, but, you know, uh, it, was still a, it was still a fun time. Um, so uh, I'm the author of uh, the Rayshader package, a package that allows you to generate beautiful maps and 3D data visualizations in R. Um, so it's an incredibly exciting time to be working with spatial data in R because the ecosystem for spatial data has evolved immensely in the past few years. Uh, so no longer is mapping purely the, the domain of experienced cartographers and closed source GIS software suites. Uh, nowadays, you can create maps with just a uh, basic knowledge of R and a few lines of code. So in this talk, um, I'm going to be showing how you can use Rayshader along with free and open data sets to create engaging 3D visualizations entirely in R using no outside software. So I'm going to show you where these types of visualizations fall in your data viz toolbox and how you can use them to bring attention to your projects and analyses and win the hearts and minds of your audience. So first things first, what is Rayshader? Uh, Rayshader is a package for 2D and 3D data visualization in R. Uh, specifically, Rayshader uses a technique called ray tracing to realistically simulate how light falls on landscapes and 3D surfaces. Uh, on the left, you can see how Rayshader calculates uh, the shadows cast by buildings in Philadelphia as the day progresses, uh, using LiDAR data from the city along with the sun calc package to calculate the position of the sun in the sky. Uh, Rayshader can take these 2D maps and project them into 3D as we see on the right. Rayshader also includes functions to apply post-processing effects to enhance these 3D maps. So here I've added a depth of field effect, uh, which blurs areas far away from the focal point, and a camera vignetting effect to add all subtle darkening by the edges uh, like you get in a high-end camera. So some people would say that visualizing spatial data isn't special, um, that you just use the same techniques you use when you visualize non-spatial data, and any distinction between the field of cartography and the field of uh, data viz is more of a historical artifact. But I think there is indeed something special about working with spatial data. Uh, so normal data visualizations live in an abstract world of well-defined axes, uh, usually uh, situated in a pristine blank void. Uh, spatial data, on the other hand, exists in our world. Uh, you just can't place an X and Y axis down, dump your data in, and expect it to stand on its own. So these data here on the right are the major highways around Monterey Bay, California. But there's no way you would know that just from looking at the road data itself. You actually have to build the world that the data lives in so people can contextualize and interpret those data points. So spatial data visualization actually combines two distinct fields, cartography, which builds the map on which the data lives, and what we consider to be traditional data visualization, uh, lines, uh, points, polygons, et cetera. So Rayshader has tools to support both of these fields. Uh, it provides functions that allows you to build the underlying map and also to add data onto that map. Um, so Rayshader does all of this with a straightforward pipeable interface where you use elevation data to generate shadows and maps. Uh, so here, the Hobart object at the top of the chain is just an R matrix, a 2D array of elevation values at every point. Um, to the right, I've plotted the data with base R's image function, uh, with terrain colors, which in my opinion doesn't really represent the terrain in a very uh, understandable way. So we can produce, uh, we can use Rayshader to produce something much nicer. Um, we can first generate a uh, base color layer with the sphere shade function in Rayshader, which colors in the map using the angle and slope of the terrain. Um, so we can already see how this is uh, far better than the pure height to color mapping, because what were once blobs of colors are now much more obviously mountains and valleys. Um, I can add a water layer with the Rayshader function detect water, which detects large contiguous flat areas on the elevation matrix and colors them in. Um, I can add some realistic shadows with the Rayshade function, 
Um, I can add another layer of shadows to darken the valleys with uh, ambi uh, the ambient shade function, um, which all in all generates a very nicely 2D map entirely from an R matrix and just a couple lines of code. Um, so this is nice, but the real magic with Ray Shader is how easy it is to transform this map into 3D. So we simply just take this output and pl uh, pass it along to the plot 3D function along with the original matrix of height values. So this function generates the 3D mesh represented by the Hobart matrix and paints the surface of it with the output of everything above. So you can generate either still snapshots of the map with the render snapshot function or call the render movie function to generate a, a spinning 3D GIF like this. Um, you know, everything in Ray Shader is customizable. Uh, that's the cartography part of the package. Um, changing the, the color palette is incredibly simple. Uh, there are seven built-in palettes, but you can create your own with the create texture function, as well as customize the water color. Um, when you create your 3D plot, you can either explore it interactively by dragging the 3D model around or control the camera programmatically with the render camera function. So this is useful if you want to create a complex animation where the camera zooms in and around different views of your data set. Um, and this is also where working with 3D models in a programming language shines. So you can program an entire animation in a single for loop like you would script any other repetitive task. So on the right, I've plotted the camera angles phi and theta along with a rendering of a diagram of the scene and a view from the camera itself. So the code showing how I generated this camera view is on the left and which shows how complex animations don't necessarily require complex code. Um, now, our planet's climate is currently going through an enormous transitory period. And due to the scale of this problem, many of us who work in government and in the public sector are often in the best position to tackle the problem of climate change. However, in order to have buy-in from the public, we need to have the proper tools to communicate these issues to decision makers in an engaging and intuitive way. Um, one of my main goals with Ray Shader was to make it dead simple to make beautiful, informative visualizations at this critical interface of land and water. Um, so here, all a user has to do to visualize a changing coastline is to set the depth of water, uh, water level in plot 3D, or actually just call the function render water. So Ray Shader handles all of the 3D rendering and slicing, and you can customize the color and opacity of the water. Um, if you aren't just interested in a map, but rather are interested in data overlaid on the map, Ray Shader also has the ability to add other types of spatial data. So here I have uh, generated some fake bird tracking data and overlaid it in 3D on a map of Monterey Bay. So I can change it to either be displayed as a continuous path with the render path function or as individual data points with render points. Uh, here, these data are simply lat long altitude values passed in as individual numeric vectors. Uh, this interface of passing X, Y, Z data is fine if you're passing in small data sets, but most spatial data in R comes packaged in spatial data formats. So R has a vast ecosystem of packages to work with spatial data, but one of the most popular and fastest growing in the community is the Simple Features Package SF. So Simple Features are a standardized way to encode spatial uh, vector data, and Ray Shader includes support for both uh, spatial line and spatial polygon overlays. Uh, so all you have to do to pass in the simple features object uh, is pass it into the corresponding ray shader function, generate line overlay or generate uh, polygon overlay, and it will add it directly to the surface of the map. So you can also specify column in the SF uh, object to add map to color, um, like an aesthetic function in ggplot. So to the left, I've again plotted the major highways around Monterey Bay, but this time in 3D. And to the right, I've plotted the buildings in Seattle where the polygon is colored by the height of the building itself. Um, so while flat overlays are nice, uh, Ray Shader goes one step further and allows you to integrate fully 3D data from SF with the render path and render polygons functions. So adding 3D data to both of these scenes is a simple one-liner uh, performed by passing in the simple features object into the corresponding function and specifying which variable maps to the third dimension. Um, so to the left, I plotted the trails in Zion National Park. And to the right, I've again plotted the buildings in Seattle, but this time as a 3D extruded polygon rather than as an image overlay. Um, so 
you can easily add labels to your map using lat long coordinates, add a scale bar, or even just add a compass uh, to give context to your spatial data. So all of these features combine to enable you to bring your viewers on a cinematic tour of your data set in a reproducible way, all within a single R script. And one of the best things about working with spatial data is how much of it is freely available and easy to access. So the USGS provides massive amounts of data on the entire US, such as gridded elevation, building footprints, tree cover, water and streams, water tables, road and trail information. The list is endless. Um, and usually the only thing you need to do to access this data is to create a free account with the USGS. Um, so I recommend uh, especially the USGS National Map website. Uh, because it provides a nice point and click interface to search for and download multiple types of data. Um, and you can really get a taste of what's available just by browsing that. Additionally, the Landsat program provides free up-to-date worldwide, uh, worldwide satellite imagery. So as an example, earlier this year in the spring, I read a news article that was discussing the annual poppy bloom in the An uh, Antelope Valley, California Poppy Reserve. So the bloom had just started earlier that week. So I went to the USGS Earth Explorer website and downloaded satellite imagery that was just taken a few days prior and combined it with elevation data also from the USGS to create a 3D representation of the landscape with this year's bloom, um, which you can see here on this ray shader map. So if you're working on a project that involves some form of constantly evolving spatial data, like let's say wildfires, um, it's an incredibly powerful tool to be able to quickly generate and automate the creation of these types of visualizations that represent current events, especially if you're dealing with the public. So if you've seen all this and you're thinking, well, I actually don't really work with spatial data. Uh, are there ways I can use Ray Shader to plot, let's say, non-geographic data? The answer is yes. Um, Ray Shader can also create 3D ggplots directly from a ggplot object. So here you can map any variable that you'd normally map to color to 3D. Um, what's nice about using ggplot to power these visualizations as a user uh, versus creating an entirely 3D plotting, a new 3D plotting interface is that you don't have to learn anything new. You can bootstrap off of your hard-earned pre-existing ggplot knowledge to produce an entirely new type of data visualization. And this API for 3D ggplots is incredibly simple. So RayShader just simply takes as an input the existing ggplots and, uh, and then it extrudes it to 3D, um, which in my opinion can lead to some pretty awesome results um, and I think it's far easier than any other 3D data viz software out there. So it's simple enough where you can actually play and experiment with your visualization, um, which as an end user, I think is really important because often you don't really know what you're doing ahead of time. You kind of play around with it. Um, and with 3D data, uh, with 3D data viz, that can often lead to kind of like a big bowl of spaghetti. Um, but uh, th this provides a nice kind of um, more limited uh, method. Um, you don't get floating points, lines, or labels but you often get something right out of the box that works really well. So all, in this, uh, all of this together, I, I think that most people would agree that R is best in its class when it comes to 2D data viz, thanks to ggplot and even just the robust uh, base R plotting system. But I wanted to make sure that it kept that title when it came to 3D data viz. And that meant R needed to compete with professional 3D rendering software. Uh, think less like a PlayStation 2 and more like uh, something out of Pixar. Um, so this required a bit of work, however, since there is nothing built into R to support high-quality 3D rendering. To support these types of visualizations, I wrote the Ray Render package, which is a path tracer written entirely in R and available on the CRAN. Um, for those of you who were talking yesterday about the difficulty about getting outside software on government servers, this is key because while it might be a hard sell to get IT people to approve uh, a standalone program like Blender, or um, many other 3D rendering software out there. Um, if you have R approved, this package comes for free when you create your local copy of the CRAN. Um, so Ray Render is a powerful, flexible, and extremely capable package for 3D rendering, but that complexity does make it somewhat more difficult on its own to pick up than Ray Shader. However, acknowledging this, uh, I've written an extremely simple function in Ray Shader that integrates Ray Render and just requires a single function call, render high quality. Um, so this function takes your current 3D scene and renders it using realistic light transport algorithms, resulting in a beautiful, realistic rendering entirely in R. And you'll see a lot of my visualizations in this talk were made using this interface. So in my opinion, it's by far the most accessible way to start making 3D uh, beautiful 3D maps 
You, no complex software build instructions or hour long YouTube walkthroughs required. Just call a single function and get a beautiful data viz as the output. So after all this, you might be asking yourself a question. Well, when should I actually use 3D plots like these? What purpose do they serve? Um, where do they fall within my toolbox? And you're right to ask this because some uses of 3D aren't great. Um, the 3D pie chart is the classic example. Uh, pie charts encode data in the size of the wedge, and usually the 3D adds nothing. Um, generally, superfluous use of 3D is to be avoided, even if you make it look really good. Um, and even non-superfluous 3D plots have some downsides. Um, so generally, data can obscure other data that's behind it. The use of perspective can make comparisons between data points harder. And generally, you lose the ability to pull out the exact value the uh, z-axis is representing. However, there are some cases where the positives do outweigh the negatives. So 3D offers some perceptual advantages over color. Um, color perception varies from person to person. So it's an obvious difference to one might not be to another. And 3D can be far more engaging than a 2D plot encoding the same data. So here's an example. We have two plots that show the same data with one plotted in a traditional 2D color plot and the other plotted and animated in 3D. So this is the classic Jon Snow cholera data set uh, here visualizing the number of nearest neighbors per infection site. Now, these two plots aren't interchangeable in purpose. If you were submitting this data to a journal, you likely wouldn't use the 3D plot because the 3D projection makes the exact values difficult to read. The, th the fact that the 3D plot is more engaging doesn't do anything for you in a journal since the hook in an academic article needs to be in the abstract, not buried in the paper. However, if you are trying to communicate these results to the public or highlight them in a talk, particularly to audiences who might not be intimately familiar with the data already, the 3D plot is far more useful. Um, 3D and animation is a far better hook than a paragraph of text to, you, uh, to readers who aren't already familiar with your topic. And RayShader provides you with the tools to easily generate these visualizations directly in R. So here's a real life example of 3D plots being used as a hook. So these animations were created by Dr. Robbie Bishop Taylor of Geoscience Australia and were used to promote their project of mapping the entire Australian continent's coastline using 30 years of Landsat imagery of the tide going in and out. So the animation on the, le on the left is a traditional figure that you'd see in a journal, um, so informative, but kind of abstract and definitely geared towards experts, as it assumes the reader is familiar with concepts like color ramps and contour plots. The animation on the right, however, was designed for much wider consumption. Um, it uses the research to show something that people will be much more familiar with, the tides going in and out, represented in a way much closer to reality than a color map. Um, so this visualization actually ended up being featured on NASA Earth and got a lot of very good attention on Twitter when it was posted. I think the original post got like 300 likes, um, which was pretty good. And the 3D animation definitely helped bring in readers uh, that otherwise wouldn't have known about the research and the work that this government agency in Australia was doing. And finally, uh, the 3D toolbox provided by RayShade and RayRender uh, allows you to produce some truly stunning and informative visualizations to bring attention to your projects. So this past year, I was tracking the Arctic sea ice and saw that we were having yet another year of record melts. So I'd seen polar ice barrel plots on the left before, uh, which show the Arctic sea ice as time progresses. But I had always found that they were a bit too abstract um, because it's hard to understand what a number like 17 million kilometers squared truly represents. Um, so I used the Ray Render package along with open data from the National uh, Snow and Ice Data Center to show the actual shape that these values corresponded to and animated these values for the past 30 years. Um, so this visualization ended up getting to the front page of Reddit, and people generally agreed that adding the globes on the right made it much more understandable, which was only possible by the great spatial ecosystem in R. This involved uh, SF, raster, um, uh, the Angular packages, uh, uh, just, just a, lot of, a lot of different packages went together to, to make something like this. Uh, but it ended up being just a kind of a short script. Um, and if you're actually interested in seeing how I made this visualization, I actually have a blog post on my website, uh, tylermw.com, where I explain the process and include all of the code. So check it out if you're interested in the details or would, you know, want to produce some sort of other global maps like this. Um, so here's some more resources if you want some more information about RayShader. Uh, for examples, I actually re recommend going on Twitter and checking out the RayShader hashtag. 
Um, so the R community has created a lot of fantastic uh, visualizations, especially recently because uh, November is the 30 day, 30 day mapping challenge. Um, so that I saw it must have been a, at least 100 um, different uh, visualizations made using R and Ray Shader that were just really great. Well, maybe not 100, but close to that. Um, the website RayShader.com has all of the documentation and lots of examples, uh, along with a fairly extensive walkthrough. And on my GitHub, I actually have materials available from a masterclass. I taught with the Pen Musa program on how to make maps and 3D visualizations with RayShader. And uh, I know there are some other talks about using LiDAR data. I actually go through that, um, show how you can use raw LiDAR data to create some maps um, you, that show uh, the, the effect of uh, you know, rising sea levels. I think in the example, I, I use Miami. Uh, but there's a really a lot of really cool things you can do with R, um, and I have some examples of that uh, that's freely available. Um, so thank you so much for uh, Lander Analytics for inviting me to speak, and thank you for listening. Thank you very much for that talk. I think we all enjoyed that. that um, whenever Tyler speaks, it always gets a lot of wows. Um, he, he does some really cool stuff with his package and enables so many people to do it. So thank you for that fun talk. We have a few...